Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. It is another question and answer show. Late summer questions are coming in, and we have got a headline story that has been uh, pinging our email inboxes quite a bit this last week, and we're going to talk about that. And you know I'm not going to do this all by myself. I am joined, as always, by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Nothing like coming back from being gone for a week and then some invasive shows up. (laughs) Yeah, some gnarly invasive that everybody is concerned about and worried about. Um and it's it's like we're living in deja vu though because this has happened before uh, a few years ago was it 2020 i believe that the murder hornet showed up yes i'm hoping i'm hoping this isn't as bad as far as public freak out because we're not covid and everybody's not home and thinking every wasp they see is a murder hornet mm-hmm. but better to be safe than sorry if you're not sure send us a picture but we're talking about the the yellow-legged hornet that recently, I guess recently news stories started hitting about it being found in, I think it was Savannah, Georgia area. I think that started coming out late last week, early this week, or this weekend. So I know I've gotten several emails already uh, about it, people finding, like like last time, uh, bald-faced hornet, cicada killer, a couple uh, robber fly, one of the, the bumblebee mimic robber flies, um, all thinking... They are the new invasive species. But as of August 22nd at 2.07 p.m., to my knowledge, it has not been found in Illinois. <laughs> exactly. We we haven't sent out the uh, the call to across the state to our colleagues, but we doubt that it's here. Um, if it is, we'll eat our words, but highly doubtful that it's here. So, Ken, I've also been getting quite a few questions, and... Um, Mine have mainly dealt with bald-faced hornets and, and bald-faced hornets. They have these beautiful aerial nests that they construct. Why would you think that I'm getting like calls for bald-faced hornets? Do the yellow-legged um, hornets, do they have a similar nest that they create? Yeah, so yellow-legged, yellow-legged hornets will also build aerial nests that look similar. And the pictures I've seen look similar to bald-faced hornet. Uh, these big paper kind of egg-shaped nests. And I will say from from the reading I've done, the yellow-legged hornets, those colonies can average about 3,000 wasps or hornets uh, kind of at the peak, whereas bald-faced hornets, they're actually a wasp, are about three 400. So I'm assuming that those yellow legs will be much larger uh, nests. And from what I've seen, they have multiple entry points, whereas bald-faced hornet has one, maybe two. On the, so I think the size would be different. But yeah, they do have these aerial paper nests that they'll create and i think they're fairly similar size so they're about three quarters of an inch long both of them maybe a little bit bigger here and there uh, but similar size so they're not nearly as big as the the northern giant hornet or murder hornet um, those are those are pretty big insects um, but they're similar size the, the big difference between yellow-legged hornet and the ones that we have here bald face hornet cicada killer um, european hornet is they have yellow legs on the, the yellow tarsi so the bottom parts of the legs are going to be yellow the bodies are are black or dark brown and the abdomens can have some yellow on it by no means an expert on this just trying to read up on it the last few days it's, it looks like there are multiple different kind of color morph subspecies and i'm not sure which one has been found in north america over in europe where it's been introduced it's the black form where it's primarily black with some yellow on it um, but there are there is a variation out there in the population um, so it's it's been found in Europe, I think that was early 2000s, mid 2000s, and it's in Spain, France, England. Uh, I think recently in Luxembourg, Belgium, so kind of that northern Europe, in Italy, um, down into there too. It's also been found in South Korea and Japan as well. So this is native to Asia, kind of Southeast Asia, China, um, and, and some of those island countries in, in Asia as well. So we're not the first to get it. Um, other places have and hopefully you know it's it's like the the murder hornets out in washington they find them they're able to track those nests down to eliminate them and this year i've not heard about them finding any of of the northern giant hornet murder hornet so hopefully they've got that eradicated and then we can do the same um, with the yellow-legged hornet 
um, as well. And and they're similar to the the murder hornets. They will go after honeybees and other pollinators uh, as potential prey sources. So that's that's one of the concerns. Is they will start feeding on those. Uh, reading some stuff in Europe, one paper they're interviewing or had quotes from beekeepers and stuff from other papers. You know, one guy had 80% loss of bees. Some of them had 30% loss. Some areas had seven, 10% reduction in overwintering colonies. They think attributed to the feeding from these hornets because they're weakening the colonies and stuff. So remains to be seen how bad it will be here, but hopefully it does not get this far north and they're able to to eradicate that population that's that's in Georgia. So it looks like the primary net risk is to some of our domesticated honeybees. And since this has never been found in North America, we don't even know what might be possible, uh, you know, what, what could they do to some of our native bees? You know, we're not quite sure. Would they, would they attack something like a, a bald-faced hornet nest or a, or a bumblebee nest mm -hmm. or, yeah, it'd be yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's probably safe to assume they would attack other pollinators uh, as well. Whether or not they go after honeybees preferentially over the others, I think that remains to be seen. But yeah, that, that is a concern. And, and again, the stinging is a concern too. If you're allergic to them, I don't, yeah, to my knowledge, I could be wrong. They're not any more, that venom is not any more dangerous than others. Um, but if you are allergic, because the colonies can get so big, that can cause problems, particularly for allergic individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else, Ken? So, Ken, is there anything else that we need to be on the lookout when it comes to murderous hornets or hornets with yellow little legs? Um, not that I know of. Um, that could change tomorrow when I read more about this stuff. But yeah, just from my kind of initial reading the last few hours, um, I, I think it's just kind of keep an eye out for it. You know, if, if you're in doubt, contact your local office, send a picture. Um, if somebody there can ID it, they'll get it to somebody who can. Um, I, I would say, you know, like everything, it's better to be safe than sorry. Send them in if you're if in doubt, and, and we can always tell you, nope, you're fine, or yes, you may want to, we may need to send this off to, I mean, USDA is the one that wants to know, probably Illinois Department of Ag, if it were to show up here. Um, but right now, I, I don't I don't think we need to worry about it, um, unless it's much more widespread than, than they initially think, so. If in doubt, send a picture. If not, we shouldn't have to worry about it um, anytime soon or ever, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as invasive species go, we are, what we really should be concerned in looking for is spotted lanternfly. Because um, ah. that's, that's <laughs> going to be here soon. If I mean, it could be here already and nobody's found it yet, but it's, it's in Indiana. I think they found some in Iowa. So it's a matter of time before it gets here. I'm seeing Tree of Heaven more and more now that i know what to look for I, that was one of the plant plants i was uh i was blinded to that plant i never i didn't see it i kind of just thought oh that's a black locust or you know or that's black walnut or you know i just thought that's some compound leaf plant i didn't pay much mind to it now i realize like tree of heaven which is a, a host species for spotted lanternfly is everywhere and so now i i was sitting in line waiting to pick my kids up yesterday and i saw this tree of heaven this whole alley full of it and i'm like I'm like i wonder would it be weird if i got out of my car and went and looked at the plants you think other other parents would think something and call the cops like i'm sneaking through someone's hedge looking for a spotted lantern fly but i didn't do it so you may embarrass your kids so go I, I might <laughs> i might i might so i didn't do it folks i stayed in my car but if i see something like how big is a spotted lantern fly it's it's a inch and a half two huh. inch I think with the wing spread, I don't think it's terribly large. Yeah. Um, actually, oh, actually, I have one right here. So this is, yeah, spotted lantern fly. You can see, I'd say wing spread out might be an inch and a half, maybe. Um, maybe two inches, but beautiful insect with its wings open. But and, Ken is really mad at me because <laughs> I have one of these. <laughs> they call some people and get me some. <laughs> so I was watching the uh, we were watching the Cardinals game last night. So this was Monday night, and they're in Pittsburgh, and they actually were showing spotted lanternfly crawling around in the stadium. So oh, gross. <laughs> so hopefully they bring gross. it back to them. Well, they'll show up in St. Louis first, so I have a little bit of time before they hop over the river. Maybe, maybe. Oh goodness. Well, Ken, 
and, and and kind of back to hornets as ken said send everything to to ken he's always happy to talk to you about um bald-faced hornets cicada killers which is what these usually turn out to be um yellow jacket and and so i i mean i do too i love telling people that my stories with bald-faced hornets is that they they can hurt people but it is unlikely unless you go up and you grab that nest and you give it a hug so you know treat them with respect they can hurt you so can a hammer so just you just you're careful you're careful with those kind of things so exactly uh, don't don't throw stuff at their nests don't do that don't try starting it on fire no because you're gonna hurt your tree mm -hmm. you set your you, tree on fire <laughs> you have angry wasps that are on fire coming after mm -hmm. you so don't do it yep as as much as you think that youtube video would would become viral and you'd become rich overnight uh you might end up in the emergency room burning down your house so don't do it yes yeah. All right, let's let's move on from this. Uh, so, we've got a, another question that's come in. So we've got a homeowner that's put down cocoa bean mulch around their new garden pond, and the pond is filled with white jumping worms. So, what are they? And how do they get rid of them? They have a bunch of jumping worms in the uh, pond. I, I'm like, well, I don't think jumping worms are white. Jumping worms, the the invasive jumping worm, is uh, an earthworm type uh uh in invertebrate soil dwelling uh, uh little little critter so what i think they are and if i get permission from the person to throw that to use their picture i'll post that right now i believe that these are cheese skippers which is a type of fly now these they're also known as ham ham flies ham skippers that's because they usually infest meat um you know you know any kind of meats they're also this type of insect is also used by forensics to help date when like a crime or a murder has happened they're known also as like cadaver flies um and so they will lay their eggs in in meat and they will eat as their their maggots form and then they'll turn into adult flies and go look for more dead stuff or meat and stuff and when food supplies are scarce they have been known to infest cocoa beans. And when you, when that cocoa bean has been harvested, they harvest that cocoa out of that to help us make delicious chocolate. That cocoa bean hole or shell is now, now has that larva or that egg in there. And they're pretty resilient. Um, uh, some of what I've read about them is that they can survive some of the heat treatments that these mulches do go through or some of that composting process. And when people go to spread them on their, landscape bed they a few days later once the moisture levels go up maybe there's a rain or there's irrigation or something all of these white maggots they're technically maggots will pop up out of the ground and they jump they they, they jump ever so slightly and that's what we were seeing here is that these maggots were were jumping from the mulch into the the little brand new garden pond that these folks had um so what to do about this uh remove all of your cocoa bean mulch uh, if that's an option and in the case of the person i was talking with that wasn't an option it was they spread it over a large area it was several inches deep and they're like i i don't want to dig all this mulch up and um and, and get rid of it so at cocoa mulch is, is also usually expensive at least in our neck of the woods because it's not very common in illinois um and so the other options are going to be you can pull the mulch aside. Uh, you can let that soil dry out. Uh, you can treat the mulch in the, or the soil with a diatomaceous earth, which in my opinion, and Ken, you, you can weigh in on this too. Like, I don't think diatomaceous earth works too well for us, at least outside in Illinois. Um, it just, is, do you see that same thing? Yeah, especially when, like this week when it's like 100% humidity yeah. um, or, or we're getting a lot of rain, that, that stuff will clump together and you have to you can use it, but you're, it, anytime it gets wet, it's going to clump, so you have to reapply. So it's more of an indoor or dry climate type use. Yeah. If you have scorpions in the Southwest, yeah, diatomaceous earth might be more useful for you. But here in the Midwest, so humid, we get fairly consistent rainfall. Uh, the way it acts is actually by cutting and pulling moisture out of that insect. And 
you know, when it gets wet, it stops working. So um, this, so there's that. So diatomaceous earth is kind of that organic based option. The other synthetic option would be to treat your mulch bed with a pyrethrin based insecticide. And because these worms are actually maggots, they are insects, the, uh, the pyrethrin insecticide would kill them. Embrace it. Get some fish. You'll have some well-fed fish. Yeah. I. Oh my gosh. So yeah, if hopefully I can use the picture from the question, but uh, if not, I'll describe it, especially for those listening. This is a garden pond that is like the, the bottom of the pond is white with these maggots. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. So throw some fish in there. They'll have a nice dinner, lunch, breakfast. Like stinky. Yep. I bet it would. So I've never used cocoa mulch. Does it smell like chocolate? It does smell like chocolate. Yes. Um, and I think some people will probably make sure that we want to mention this. Uh, it is attractive to dogs and dogs will eat it and it is toxic to dogs. So if you do have dogs, want to avoid that. Um, but otherwise, cocoa mulch is actually, I think it's a very pretty mulch, aesthetically pleasing. And I do like that chocolate smell. Um, so if I didn't have a dog and I mean, I'm not really worried about the, the uh, cheese skippers, but there are some human health issues there. Like we could talk about those. Um, I, I I'd use it maybe in a little spot in the garden, not the whole, not the whole landscape, but yeah. <laughs> Did you ever encounter cocoa mulch down in Florida? Uh, I don't remember ever coming into contact with it. They like pine straw down there, don't they? Yeah, yeah, North Florida. There's lots of pine trees and uh, the pine nugget <clears throat> mulch. Mm -hmm. That's another of the well, uh, the bag stuff you get here, the cypress and the dyed stuff. Yeah, and and I, I mentioned I wasn't too concerned about the cheese skipper flies. However. Like they're not going to necessarily hurt you, but there are have been um, shown that if we consume like the meat, and they also do go into cheeses and things like that. If they if we consume that, they actually will live inside of us. Um, sometimes they will um, latch onto our intestines. They have hooked uh, mouth openings, and so they can cause us intestinal distress. So. Um, they're actually delicacies. Uh, there's a type of cheese in Italy where they want them to infest that cheese. They then eat the cheese with the maggots and all in there, and it is supposed to be a delicacy. Um, I, might, I draw the line at blue cheese. I definitely, it's a hard no on this cheese. Road trip. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> eat our cicadas next year and wash it down with some maggot cheese. Oh, nope, can't do it. <laughs> It's supposed to be really good, though. Uh, well, it's only one might... way to find out. <laughs> we'll go to the doctor after that and say, how do you get rid of these parasites <laughs> in my gut? Probably not good for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, Ken. Um, uh, well, let's follow up gut parasites with a tree question. Um, so someone is considering buying a house, but wants to make sure that the roots of some large trees on the property are not are not or will not interfere with the foundation of the home. So the trees are about 25 feet away from the house. How far out do the tree roots go and is their foundation safe? I would say for most trees, your, your roots are definitely about to the, the drip line, probably two or three times that. So they're they're gonna be, because like, remember these are good sized mature trees. So they're gonna have the roots up into that, up by that foundation. Um, so roots can get into the foundation of a house. They're not going to cause the cracks. They're not going to penetrate through that. Typically, they're going to find cracks or something, and they'll exploit those cracks and and work their way in. Um, and, and there's, I mean, short of fixing your foundation, there's really no way you can prevent that. You know, they were asking about, you know, where can I see where the roots are? The only thing I can think of is getting an air spade mm -hmm. and and getting all that out. There's you wouldn't be able to use a die or anything because you wouldn't be able to see it uh, and stuff. But it, it's probably safe to assume you're going to have roots. Uh, up close to that unless you've got some incredibly compacted soils that they can't make it through. Uh, and best bet's probably going to be do a house inspection. Have, have them pay careful attention to that foundation if they're if you're concerned. See if there's any cracks or anything that may need to be taken care of. Um, 
before you were to purchase the house. And let's say probably your cinder block brick foundations are probably going to be a little more likely to have trouble than a than a poured foundation, probably more likely to have cracks that they would be able to to get into. And I don't I haven't heard about it happening terribly often. I know it's always a concern of people, but I want to say it's the exception to the rule, but I don't think it's maybe as common as sometimes it's made out to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm no foundation expert, but um, I, I have I have had water in my basement. <laughs> and the fix for that, uh, as I was walking around with, with the tile slash foundation expert, he pointed out a vertical crack in our poured concrete foundation. And that vertical crack, he said, I bet you that goes all the way from the top to the very bottom of your foundation. So I dug a really deep hole so deep that like I was doing handstands to try to get to the bottom of the foundation and I didn't make it to the bottom, but I was, I was almost there. And he was right as I could keep digging and digging and digging. And that crack went all the way from the top of that foundation wall, all the way to the bottom. And so I, I he said, you know, you probably don't have to get the whole thing, but seal as much as you can with a little bit of silicone um, caulking. And um, you know, that that's primary recommendation seal caulk all the, the cracks and crevices of your foundation there to help eliminate that and as ken said trees are not they're not roaming the soil with little pickaxes and hammers trying to chip their way into your house they can only take advantage of a situation so they can't make it worse but that they they cannot create the crack you know so we had a in our house our house is over 100 years old it's got a brick um, foundation we had a large maple tree that we took down a couple of years ago, um, but it was probably 10, 15 feet from the house. We never had mm -hmm. problems with, with that getting into the foundation. So I'm not saying it's, it's not going to happen in that situation or it's never going to happen, but I'd say more often than not, you're okay. Unless it's growing right on top of the, like you planted underneath your eave, mm -hmm. um, then, then you may get into some trouble. In more ways, there's, there, there's more problems there. You got to worry about more than just foundation. And I have seen that where a tree literally grows up into that 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 roof overhang there, and it was planted there on purpose. And some there's some trees they're like angled out. They had to like do some corrective pruning instead of cutting the tree at the base and killing it and planting one properly farther away from the home. They correctively pruned it so that it angled back and forth around the roof and that's just you're not, asking for problems not a good idea <laughs> no <laughs> all right let's let's go back to the ponds real quick here so we've got a water lotus water lotus is taking over a pond what can you do to get rid of that so water lotus it's the american water lotus is a native plant to our neck of the woods and but it can take over a pond in a hurry. It is an aggressive spreading water plant. Uh, it likes the roots like to be submerged in the water and the leaves like to emerge above the water. Um, and sometimes the leaves will actually be um, suspended above the water. Um, and sometimes the leaves will just be floating on the water. They have a beautiful flower. Their seed heads are often used in arrangements, uh, floral arranging, uh, and I believe every part of that plant is edible. Native Americans would dig the roots and, and eat them kind of like a potato. And so it's, it's, it's a common plant and it commonly goes and takes over small farm ponds, backyard garden ponds and the like. Uh, so for controlling this, you have a few options. Now, most people have tried a lot of the mechanical options, which is pulling by hand, but you can exhaust that root system, especially in a smaller size pond so you can just pull and pull and pull as long as as you can keep up with it and you can eventually kill it you can shade up the the, the pond so the interesting thing about pond weeds and if you look at ponds uh most of them are growing in full sun most pond weeds are adapted to full sun uh, so there's not many trees growing in the middle of the pond unless you've got bald cypress or something so shade covering that area with with some type of tarp or plastic cover for smaller backyard ponds can help kill and eliminate um, troublesome garden weeds or pond weeds now the water lotus requires a certain depth 
for it to be able to uh, photosynthesize and send up a, a shoot and 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 survive. And if you have a larger pond, the recommendation is to make it make the edges deeper, so four foot or deeper. And these plants cannot grow up and 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 uh, grow leaves and flower and so on and so forth. And it's interesting to see this because, especially in my part of the stretch of the Mississippi River, there's a water, a lot of water lotus growing along the edges. And you can tell when that main channel is becoming silted in because the water lotus creeps out towards the center of the river. So it, it's pretty cool to watch, but uh, not cool if you're a barge, uh, if you're a, a barge captain. Uh, so other things, you can draw down your pond, you can empty it if you can. If you have fish, you need to leave at least eight feet of water in the center so they can survive. Um, if, if you don't have fish, you can just totally empty it, let it dry out, plants will die. Now, a lot of people have tried these things. Sometimes they work, sometimes, especially with hand pulling, it doesn't work. Um, they op often turn to chemical control. There are several herbicides that you can use. You have to make sure that whatever herbicide you use, that it is labeled for use on water, surface water, ponds, lakes, et cetera. So the active ingredients that have given known uh, excellent control, we'll say, for water lotus is going to be imazapir and 2,4-D. I could give you product names, but I don't know what listeners, viewers, I don't know what you have on your shelf in your hometown. So uh, Imazapir and 2,4-D, they are rated as excellent in terms of controlling water lotus. Uh, Mississippi State Extension does recommend a surfactant added to it so that it helps it stick to the leaf. And so read your label directions. It'll tell you how much surfactant to mix into your product there. Glyphosate is another one that doesn't give excellent control. It's considered good control. And um, glyphosate is, uh, again, commonly called Roundup, but you do not spray Roundup. There is, you have to use a pond, you have to use that product labeled for ponds. Um, and so some of those include Rodeo, Aquanet, or Aquamaster, Aquanet, Aquanet, um, and Refuge. So those are just a couple different brands out there for the glyphosate-based uh, spray, which is kind of middle of the road, 2,4-D and imazapir considered excellent though, in terms of their control. Is this one where people grow them in pots? I think you can so kind of avoid some of these issues. Yeah, you could grow them in pots. Um, and especially if you have like a hard liner garden pond, um, it, it, probably won't spread in that. Now, if you have a, a like an earthen pond and you grow in pots, that rhizome or that that root that it can move probably out of that pot, especially with flowing water. Um, so you can probably slow or reduce its spread um, in most garden ponds by growing in a pot. But I, I, I see how it moves up and down the river. And so it does move, uh, even though it's, you know, in the water. Well, your pots every year and print it up. That's right. Oh, yes. More work than one. I think it's a cool plant. Um, and I, I, I love kind of those emergent kind of shoreline uh, aquatic plants, especially the old stories from the European settlers as they moved to the West and they talk about canoeing through the bottomlands of the Mississippi River. And it's just, it, you're literally, they were canoeing through jungles of plants like over their head. It, pretty fascinating. Well, Ken, our last question of the day is about apples that have large black spots on them. So what are they and how do they get rid of these black spots? All right, we'll pop up a picture here right now so you can see what we're talking about uh, but if you can't see it so we've got an apple it's got some large black spots on them they're kind of sunken they have these concentric circles or target pattern on them uh, and more than likely this is going to be bitter rot uh, this is one where you cut it open kind of have a v-shaped necrotic dead area going towards the center of the apple to show a picture of that too 
Uh, so this is one of the fruit rots, summer, summer fruit rots we see in apples. Um, bitter rot, black rot, white rot are kind of the three main ones that you see in apple production. Uh, and with this, once your apples get it, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, just just get rid of them uh, and, and hope for better luck next year. Uh, so, so the big thing for these in all orchards, but particularly home orchards, is good sanitation. Uh, when these apples die, they may form a mummy. So they just get this big black wrinkly apple that's all shriveled up that hangs on the tree. And that will stay on the tree throughout the winter into the spring. So you want to make sure you go in and clean all those up because uh, that can be a source of inoculum or where that disease is going to spread uh, the following spring. So do a good job of sanitation, get those mummies out of the trees, get the fruit off the ground that have dropped. Uh, they can cause cankers on the on the stems, so sunken areas that are diseased. You want to prune those out. Um, so just do a good job of getting all that uh, apples, leaf litter, all of that, get that out of your, from underneath your tree, get it out of your landscape, bag it, burn it. Um, whatever you, however you need to get rid of that out of your landscape. So you're not having all of those spores being released uh, in, in the spring to reinfect your apples next year. Uh, next year, you, we, unless you've got an incredibly disease-resistant cultivar, and to my knowledge, there really aren't any cultivars that are going to be resistant to these fruit rots, uh, you're going to need to spray, uh, especially here in the Midwest. We've got a nice humid climate, which is perfect for disease development. Um, it's not like out on the west coast california and washington where they don't have any humidity and they can get away with not spraying anything you know we've got to do that here uh, and you know there are um spray guides you know spray charts you know at at the different um development stages of, of tree fruit whether it's apples peaches grapes what have you you know silver tip um petal fall all those different stages you make these different sprays to protect your plants from different diseases and pests um, so with um, with these fruit rots for home growers, Captan is going to be your best bet, and this is going to be on your cover sprays and stuff, and that's going to protect those apples from those spores landing on them and germinating and affecting your fruit. So good sanitation, and make sure you're following a spray schedule the following year, and Captan is, what is going to take care of pretty much your, your fungal diseases, in, in this case, your fruit rots. And I'll say there are some smaller um Sooty blotch and fly speck, these are small black spots you get on apples. You can rub those off, they're superficial. But again, spraying will help eliminate those. If you're you know you're not selling these, it's not a big deal. You can wipe them off. But commercial production, you can't have that sooty blotch and fly speck because nobody's gonna buy those. I love polishing an apple straight off the tree with my shirt because you like pull it off the tree and it's this dull. Uh, kind of colored apple if you polish it you wipe off all a lot of that dust and dirt and stuff that's accumulated on over the summer and it reveals this bright shiny apple and then you can eat it as long as it's not rotten don't wear a white shirt when you're doing that that's right <laughs> you you probably be like i'm gonna eat this thing now <laughs> yeah things get dirty outside it's just the nature of things so uh ken i guess that means i'll just go at now that we've got the the apple rots taken care of i'm just going to plant uh junipers and hawthorns next to my orchard is that does that work out still no maybe not uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> make an apple orchardist upset by planting junipers and hawthorns next to it so i'll be cedar, happy with you cedar apple rust but there are some cultivars a little more tolerant resistant to that but yeah Home orchard, no big deal. Commercial orchard, yeah, they may get a little... They'll be upset. Little upset yeah. 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 Well, that was a lot of great information about what's happening around the state and also just what happens in Georgia when it comes to the yellow-legged hornet. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. And a special thank you to Ken for hanging out, answering questions every single week. Ken, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being here, too. It's been fun. It's been nice. fun. Go back, start catching up on emails again here. Let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. It will be a garden bite because Ken and I will be at the Farm Progress Show in Decatur, Illinois. So, hey, if you want to see us, stop on by the Illinois Extension tent and you can uh, chat with uh, one, of, one of us or the even more knowledgeable Illinois Extension folks that will also be joining us there. 
Uh, we're gonna have a pollinator display. We're gonna have, I'll have ginger there. We're gonna have all kinds of uh, gardening, vegetable, landscaping information. So stop on by, check us out, Indicator at the Farm Progress Show. Listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing. Good thing this isn't live.